Mark chapter 9, verses 38 to 41. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for the one who, is, who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is, against, is not against us is for us. For truly, I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. This is the word of God. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you now because you are our hope. You are a sovereign God over heaven and earth. And Father, you are good. And you're moving and you're working all things according to the purposes of your will. Father, we come to you this morning because we are a people that are broken. We are living in a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. Brother against brother. Father against son. Mother against daughter. Father, we have not loved you, as our responsive reading says. We have not loved you and loved our neighbor as ourselves. We have sinned, and we have not done the good that you have called us to do. Father, And it is not by our works, our charity. Lord, it is by your Spirit working in us, making us like Christ as we put off the old and put on the new. Father, we need you. You are our only hope in life and death. Father, and we come to you on behalf of our nation, a nation that is deeply scarred and deeply wounded. And the sin of racism for the past 400 plus years has festered deep within our society and our institutions and our families and our own hearts. Father, we repent individually corporately, as a church. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. Father, and it's not by just merely activity. It's not by listening. It's not by protesting. It's not by following our leaders that genuine change will come, though those are necessary. And those are needed to fight injustice as the prophets have called us to. As Israel did not worship God in the right way and it was affected in, the, in, the, uh, in their society. Father, we have not valued you. We have not revered your holiness. We have downplayed our own sinfulness. And we thought we can just ignore the problem and it won't affect us. Father, we repent. And Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. To hear our brother or sister. Father, I pray that the Christians in this nation will not be wrapped up with political alliances and social media memes that are shallow. Father, and that we would not um, hate our neighbor because they don't look like us and they don't vote like us, but that we would love we would humbly serve our brothers and sisters, our friends, our neighbors, and that we'd be like Christ. We need you, Father. May Ocean Park be uh, a place, a catalyst of change here in Jack's Beach, in our families, in our city, in our nation, in the world. Father, we also pray for those in the congregation that are not here. Lord, though I look on this group of brothers and sisters and my heart overflows with love, I recognize we're not whole. There are many brothers and sisters who are not able to come today. Father, we pray for them. We love them. We are not whole without them. May your spirit comfort them and uplift them. May we be diligent to reach out to them. Father, we also lift Andy Rossi up to you right now, Father, as he is in incredible pain 
and the doctors have few answers to why that is. Father, I pray that you would give rest to his body. I pray that the test would provide clarity about what is happening, Lord, and I pray that his faith would overflow. Father, we thank you for Andy, for the love that he has for you and the love that he has for the congregation, how he so humbly serves Christ by serving his church. Father, we need you. We love you and we trust you. In the name that is above all names, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Andrew, if you would um, make sure you have my sermon notes and try to follow along so you have my, um, if this doesn't work. Because I'm not getting anything for some reason. Fenway Park. When I was a little boy, I, my father used to take me to Fenway Park all the time. And it's the oldest uh, park in the major leagues. It was built in 1912. For over a century, it's been home to Major League Baseball, various teams, and also the Boston Red Sox. Gr the greats of baseball have come through the, the yard at Fenway, Babe Ruth and Ted Williams and Carl Yastrzemski and David Ortiz. When you go to Fenway, there are wooden seats. It's the only park in baseball that has wooden seats. Uh, Yaki Way is, you hear the, the roar of the crowd and the, the smell of the food that's cooking, all different sorts. Then you see over the left field uh, foul line, the Sitco sign that's been shining in the night for years and years. And who can go to Fenway and not notice the large, ominous green monster in left field that likes of Jim Rice and uh, Yastrzemski and Nomar Garcia Parra have hit doubles off for years and years. Fenway is holy ground and it has held moments like Ted Williams' last home run, Carlton Fisk's walk-off home run in the 1975 World Series, and the 1999 All-Star Game. Fenway is holy ground to baseball enthusiasts. Though the aisles are tight and the seats are small, Fenway is revered uh, as a cathedral that provides an un uh, unforgettable experience unless your ticket says Grand Sand Section 23, Row 2, Seat 17. If you're the lady in the purple, you probably sat down thinking, I paid way too much for this seat. It says Obstructed View. And if you notice, she can't see home plate because of where her seat is, because Fenway gets in the way of itself. The disciples here in Mark chapter 9 had the same problem. They couldn't see this spectacular picture of the kingdom of God. Why? The kingdom of God that was unfolding in front of them because they couldn't get past seeing themselves. They couldn't see what Jesus was doing because of themselves. And brothers and sisters, you and I often have the same problem. We can't see the spectacular work that Christ is doing among the nations, how he is unfolding his kingdom in our midst on earth as it is in heaven, because we are more concerned about making people like us rather than making people like Jesus. Therefore, this morning, I want you to know this, that the kingdom of God is not defined by who belongs to us, thank goodness, but who belongs to Jesus. The kingdom of God is not um, defined by who belongs to us, but who belongs to Jesus. Now, for those of you taking notes, usually my pattern is to bring up my points, but I have no points today. Um, I have a point, uh, and that was my point. It's short. I'm, I'm working at 20 minutes, and I know no, none of you believe me. Um, but once again, the disciples here in Mark chapter 9 are, are coming together, and they're beginning to they ask Jesus questions, things that are on their heart. And notice in 938, John, this is the first mention of John, in only mention of John in the book of Mark, he comes to Jesus and he asks Jesus a question. And he says this, John said to Jesus, teacher, 
We saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not following us. So just to set the picture again, a man is casting out demons in the name of Jesus, but it was not a na- man that the disciples recognized. And this time John speaks up, and he asks this question, and the disciples see him, and they see him casting out, they don't know who he is, and they try to stop him. You're not allowed to do that. Hey, uh, Steve, turn the AC up to 72, please. It's a little, I, some of the ladies are a little cold. Lisa Patterson's just about under the pew, freezing right now. So uh, I knew the doors would be open, so I turned the AC low. And the, the disciples don't know who this man is, but they're attempting to try to stop him, to stop what he's doing. And just a little context to be able to understand, uh, in the first century, uh, there were exorcists that would go around and they would attempt to cast out demons in the name of powerful names. Solomon, various deities they would use, and it's no doubt that a miracle worker like Jesus, who has the power to cast out demons, we've seen him do this, the power to heal the sick and and restore health to the, the lame, that they would use the name of Jesus. And from what we can tell from the, the, the verbiage of the disciples is that he was successful in doing this, but the disciples weren't comfortable doing this because they They don't know who he is. So they came up and notice that this man is casting out people, uh, demons in the name of Jesus. They try to stop him. But notice why in the verse at the end of verse 38, we attempted to stop him because he was not following who? Us, the disciples. What they should have said, we tried to stop him because he's not following you, Jesus. But the problem that had been building, and we can see this in the lives of the disciples, the problem was that they were, because they were in the inner circle, and not to mention Peter, James, and John being in the, 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 even the closer, more intimate circle of Jesus, that had begun to go to their head, and it was beginning to have a detrimental effect on the disciples, especially John. Here, John harbors resentment or, uh, against this, this exorcist, this elitist attitude he has. We're going to see in a chapter from now in 1035 where he asked Jesus for his brother James and him to sit at the right and the left hands of Jesus in glory. And then in Luke chapter 9, John, uh, it's not recorded in Mark, but it says, and when his disciples, James and John, saw what was happening, this resistance to Jesus, what did they do? Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and, and consume your opponents? And Jesus was like, no, what is wrong with you guys? So what is happening with them is John, his concern was not that a demon-possessed man was being set free in the powerful name of Jesus, And it's ironic because the disciples, the the chapter before, they could not cast out demons in the name of Jesus, but this man is, and they're trying to stop him. Their concern was not the the, uh, uh, setting free of this man. Their concern was that he was not working um, with them, but he was working independently of them and not Jesus. Ocean Park pride has a subtle way of emboldening petty criticism and nitpicking others while ignoring our blind spots and glossing over the sin and the contradictions that are in our own lives. Pride is like carbon monoxide gas, odorless, tasteless, that infects us and will destroy us. We can see it in others, but we cannot see it in ourselves. And if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit of Christ to convict us and our brothers and sisters in, who will lovingly point it out to us, it will destroy us. Remember, what we learned last week is that greatness in the kingdom of Jesus is not what we do, but who we serve that we humbly serve the humble. And so the disciples, in effect, have exchanged humble service for uniformity 
with themselves. They have made themselves the standard by which they measure who belongs to the kingdom of Jesus. That's a problem. That's the poison of pride. Ocean Park is really easy for us to forget that humility. Humility is fundamental. Uh, It is a fundamental virtue to Christ's kingdom. Our Lord and Savior himself, what does Philippians 2 say? Humbled himself. He laid aside the rights as Lord and creator of the universe to come and serve and die for his creation. Why do we think we are exempt from the po- to, to then to put that subtle poison of pride to death? It's easy to discount somebody and discard somebody who has success and who has influence and who is in the spotlight because poison, poison, uh, pride poisons us. But notice as Jesus continues, but Jesus said, verse 39, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward to speak evil of me. Now imagine the disciples who throughout the book are showed to be very flawed. They were caught a bit off guard by the fact that the, Jesus rebukes them and not praises them. They were expecting Jesus to say, oh, good job. I don't want any unauthorized use of my name. And they were rebuked. Jesus in these words, doesn't endorse what the man is doing. He doesn't approve what the more, uh, 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 disprove what the man is doing. He doesn't say whether the man was a true follower of him or not. Jesus says that a person cannot use Jesus' name to do mighty works and then speak ill of him later. Jesus is reminding us that we must be that he is able to do all sorts of things and use all sorts of people. Throughout Scripture, we see this played out. God used godly men like the prophet Samuel and godless men like Nebuchadnezzar. He used faithful prophets like Moses and wicked prophets like Balaam. God used sages of wisdom like Solomon and animals like Balaam's donkey. The Lord used a broad spectrum of people to accomplish his purposes in this world. John Calvin writes this, he says, Christ did not wish that the man exercising demons should be forbidden. Not that Jesus had given him authority or proved what he did. Or even wish the disciples to approve of it, but because when by any occurrence God is glorified, we ought to bear with it and rejoice. Ocean Park, those who are not our enemies should be considered our allies. Why? Because Jesus is about to show us that we as Christians are locked in a life and death struggle with the forces and the powers of evil in this world and darkness. And we need to be willing to receive any ally in that battle, in that struggle. Notice verse 40 and 41, how Jesus explains this. He says, for the one who is not against us is for us. In this struggle, in this that we have, this is not a a universal statement. It's in this battle, in the forces of darkness, those who are not against us are our allies and can help us, even if they're not believers. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Jesus will by no means lose his reward. Jesus is showing that the storm clouds of opposition are growing darker and more bleak, and Jesus and his disciples will be filled and face opposition. Satan, in these last days that we are are living in, that was initiated at the cross, Satan is unfurling one final terrible rebellion against the kingdom of God. It is a rebellion that is filled with persecution, with destruction, and with um, desperation. The battle will be so intense and persecution so widespread that a simple act of giving somebody a cup of water because they're Christian will be seen like an incredible kindness. And though we live in a 
uh, dispensation of time here in the West, in the United States. This is our brothers and sisters throughout the world who only know a handful of Christians. And to be able to receive kindness from their neighbors for the fact that they are a Christian, understand the truth of this verse. It's unwise, Ocean Park. It's unwise and unfaithful to fight silly battles on meaningless hills. Those who refuse to recognize that there are people that belong to Jesus who don't look like us and act like us and think exactly like us and, and we're fighting against them. They are the wrong enemies and, they, and, and we possess an a, a insufficient, un, faulty understanding of the kingdom of God. A kingdom of God that is be, a view of kingdom of God that is being obscured by our own pride that is before us and it is, we're so consumed with ourselves and making people like us that we fail to see what God is doing in the nations. What God has told Habakkuk, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. Ocean Park, we must not fight those who are working in other parts of Christ's vineyard. J.C. Ryle, the great Anglican, and I'm glad I quoted an Anglican today uh, for this very reason, is, bring it up for me, Andrew, better a thousand times that the work should be done by other hands than not done at all. Happy is he who knows something of the spirit of Moses when he said, would God that all the people profit, uh, be prophets. And of Paul when he says, if Christ is preached, I rejoice, yea, I will rejoice. The kingdom of God is not de defined by who belongs to us, by, but, but by who belongs to Jesus. But the question now that we have is, how do we get out of the way? How do we get out of the way so that the beautiful panorama of who Christ is and what he is doing is able to be seen through us and seen through the church? I love this quote by Rupertus Maldinius. He lived in uh, the 17th century, and he wrote a pamphlet. He was a, a German uh, Lutheran. He said, in the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, humility. In all things, charity. And I think, unfortunately, we get these often backwards. The first thing he says is unity. Because remember, there is one body and one spirit you are called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, who is all and through all and in all. So what are the essentials? What are the essentials that we need to fight for, that we need to be bold for, to stake our claim and, and stake our flag upon these hills that are necessary the nature of God, holy, the nature of men created in the image of God but fallen and sinful, the person and work of Jesus Christ, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, the authority and inspiration of Scripture. These, brothers and sisters, are the hills that we are to die on, to fight for, to boldly, like the, like the Marines at Iwo Jima, to lay our lives down that these may be known. Why? Because without these things, if we lose these hills, we cannot have peace with God and we cannot glorify God. These are the essentials. These are the things that when Jesus prayed that Chris read for us this morning, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus prayed for y'all. Not just the disciples, not just the, the big wigs, for y'all. That they may all be what? One. Not just Ocean Park, not just the SBC, all gospel loving churches who people where, where people belong to jesus why because the father and i i the, i and the father are one father you are in me and i in you that they also may be in us so the world may believe that you have sent sent me therefore we must fight for unity in all these things for god is one 
Not only do we fight for unity, but there is humility and liberty. There is room in God's kingdom for brothers and sisters to have different understandings of the non-essential, yet very important, and doctrine. Baptism, spiritual gifts, election, church government, eschatology, eschatology, the ordination of women. Each one of these doctrines are very important, but they are not essential for salvation. We are not saved by our view of baptism. How are we saved? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. How you understand these doctrines will determine if you worship Christ as a Baptist, a Presbyterian, an Anglican, a Brethren, an Evangelical Free, or non-denominational. And all those names and all those groups and churches are churches that we pray for. We pray for Roland Maust and... and, um, uh, um, David Bell and, and uh, Josh Hinson and Ortega Prez and non-denominated church like Community Bible and Matt Owens and E. Free like Community Bible and Alan Cagle, all men in churches who love the gospel. But we have different understandings of the non-essentials, yet they are important and they are that we need to work through and talk through with humility and love. In heaven, we will fully understand that, um, that we are saved despite the teachings of our denominations because we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And until that day, we must live at peace with all who belong to Jesus. And we must fight for peace because it's very easy for p- the poison of sin to come in and poison the well of the Christian unity that Christ prays for us. We must embrace our siblings in the faith that have a different understanding of important, non-essential doctrines that we may glorify Christ who died to rescue us from every tribe and every tongue and every nation. Therefore, in all of these things, we have liberty with humility, in unity, and then finally, in charity. The middle ring of the gospel of unity is the most important, but the outer ring, uh, the understanding, is one of the most divisive. Far too often, people take the um, the not the their per, um, convictions and persuasions, and they push it to the center. That if you can't be a Christian unless you feel the same way about this that I do, and it's dividing brothers and sisters. Far too often, people make those the, uh, the sticking point. I lost my fourth page of notes. Um, it's the fear of every um, pastor ever uh, who has a manuscript. But they are things like, Andrew, bring it down for me, please. You have it. This outer ring, this of the uh, convictions that we have that brothers and sisters uh, who love the gospel and love the Lord all come together for, thank you very much, you saved the day, things like alcohol and tattoos, music and movies, political parties, educational methods, worship styles, cultural issues of the day, leisure time, how we dress, how we spend our money, how we talk. These convictions are important and often they're built on biblical truth, but they're neither universal nor binding on every believer. There's a wide array of differences within the family of God and the bounds of the gospel, and that is okay. There are a lot of different people who love Jesus that think differently than you and vote differently than you. In the essentials, unity. In the non-essentials, humility. In all things, charity. We can speak with the tongue of men and angels. If we have not love, we are a clanging symbol. Ocean Park, may we be disciples of Jesus who don't obstruct the glorious beauty of Christ's kingdom because of our pride. May we remember that the kingdom of heaven is not defined by who belongs to us, but who belongs to Jesus. Amen.